here's our first article of the day we're going to cover, which is Jan Ponshi on the Dance of the Knights. I'm not proud. This is an article written by Colin McGurdy from the United Kingdom. Grandmaster Daniil Dubov missed out on tying world number one, Magnus Carlsen, for first place in the FIDE World Blitz Championship 2023 after both he and GM Jan Pomashi got zero points for the night moves only draw they made in round 11. In a 59-minute New Year's Eve podcast, Nepomneshi talked about that game and a host of other topics, including Carlson's separate lounge, the dress code in Samarkand, and the way GMs Ali Reza Frugia, Gukesh Damaraju, and earlier Ding Loren qualified to the candidates' tournament. All right. Two-time world champion challenger, world number five, Nepomneshi ended 2023 with an English podcast that delved into all the drama of the World Rapid and Blitz Championships in Samarkand, Uzbekistan. All right, you can check it out below. Now, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to um, watch it because I think they cover most of it in here. But let's uh, let's keep going. On his World Rapid and Blitz performance in the three day Rapid tournament, Diplomacy finished on eight out of thirteen, only a win in the last round, away from a twelve play twelve way tie for third place. But he called the tournament one of the worst I've ever played in Rapid. He said he never got over his round two draw against an untitled 15-year-old Kazakh player, Inur Amangeldi. I got out. I got probably outplayed by a 2,000-rated young player from Kazakhstan, which was something I didn't expect to happen. Eventually, the game finished in a draw, but it was quite shocking. Now, this is the, we're going to be talking about this a lot today. I have to be honest. We're going to be talking a lot about the rating system today because one thing that I think a lot of top players seem to be misunderstanding is that the chess world we live in today is very different from the world that we lived in before the pandemic. So, to be clear, if this was a game that was played online, I have no doubt, zero doubt in my mind that Jan would have basically accused this kid of cheating. No doubt in my mind. But over the board is obviously different than online, and so therefore the barrier to cheating is much higher. It's way higher. It's more, I, would, I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's a lot higher at the very least. So when Nepo gets outplayed by a 2000 over the board, it's like, what is going on? What's wrong? And this is why if I tie it back to the, the bigger topic, which we're going to be talking about a lot today, it's very clear to me that there is something wrong with the rating system these days whether it's players playing online during the pandemic and becoming incredibly strong and not playing over the board there is something that is off with the system altogether because this should never happen mathematically speaking a player who is 800 points lower rated should never draw or win against a top player i think the percentage chance is something like 0.04 percent don't quote me on that because i could be wrong but it's something like 0.04 percent it's basically impossible um, according to the ELO system, which was created by Arpa Arpad ELO uh, about, a, I want to say like maybe a hundred years ago, maybe it's less than that, but a great professor of math and statistics. So, all right, on we go. Uh, let me close. Let me close the window. Okay. Nepomneshi referenced a team that had suffered its worst start to a season in terms of defeat since 1930. When you speak about conditions and you speak about the form, there's some good form, bad form, and then my form in rapid. And then in the evening, you check some sports results of the English Premier League and you see Manchester United. So it's always an inspiration. By the way, wishing Manchester United the speediest recovery to their usual level. You can you check some sports results. Oh, wait, that's just a quote. Okay. Napoleon described a two-day blitz tournament that followed as much better, but still far from excellence. This time, however, there's a lot more to say with, with the final standings requiring an asterisk, of course, because Dubov got half point less, as did Napoleon. Okay, Dubov and Nepomneshi made a draw in round 11, but it turned into a loss for both players. All other things being equal, that half point would have seen Dubov tie Carlson for first place, and while an extra half point would only have taken Nepomneshi into a tie for fourth place with GM Maxime Vashi Legrand. He lost out more financially speaking. Dubov took $50,000 for second place instead of $55,000 for joint first, while Nepomneshi lost a 77 50 difference between a tie for fourth and a four way tie for fifth with GMs Arjun Aragaisi, Lavana Ronin, and Dennis Lazovic. But now let's get to the game. Okay. On the dance of the night, Dubov 0 0 versus Nepomneshi. It didn't last long, just 42 seconds separated one night of three from 13 night of three draw. As Dubov and Nepomneshi dance their nights around the board. Okay. The game instantly lit up social media with some chess fans amused and some horrified. Nepomneshi addressed that reaction when he comments in the podcast I'm not a fan of this game, I'm not proud or something. 
I don't find it too shameful, but of course it's not something I would be glad to remember. So to those of you, I think there are some part chess fans who found this disrespectful. I'm just sorry. It was never meant to be like this. It was obviously a form of protest, which I also find maybe too much, but basically what's done is done. Okay. Reasonable take from Nepo there. I actually, it sounds quite, quite fine. Nothing too surprising. Um, I would say, you know, draws are a part of the game of chess. They do happen. The way they went about it obviously wasn't right. But as I've said before, and I will reiterate, reiterate this once again, I think the idea that Fiat account that game is 0 0 was a mistake. I, I will just say that outright. I don't think that's what should have happened. I think what should have happened is the player should have been fined a certain amount of money, but the result should have, should have, should have stood. Um, now, that's my personal take, obviously. A lot of people might be mad at me for having that take. Um, but. I do think that in general, the way they should have dealt with it is there should have been a hefty fine rather than scoring the game as 0-0. Because if it, when you score the game 0-0, it takes away from the final standings. And yes, there is an asterisk where say, say you were to find both players $10,000, just as an example. Um, the score would still stand and you would have, there would have been a tiebreak. You would have had the actual results from the games that have been played counting. Um, so I know there are going to be, be, be people who are mad at me for saying that, but I think that I don't really like that approach. I think there should have been a, a, a hefty fine rather than scoring the game as zero, zero personally. That's just, that's just my take. Uh, I know some people will say, well, if you score at zero, zero, that, that is a fine because they get less money in the final standings, but I still feel like chess loss on the one hand, cause there should have been a tiebreaker played between Daniil Dubov and Magnus Carlson for first place. So, um, Let's let's keep going though. It says do Bob would later note on Facebook. Of course, such games are always feedback to the actions of the organizers and or the work of arbiters. What were they protesting about? Well, there were a number of issues, which we'll get to, but the main one was a dispute five rounds earlier that had drastically prolonged what was already said to be the most grueling day of the championship. GM Andrew Z. Hong appealed the loss on time against GM Yu Yankee, with the appeals committee eventually concluding Hong had likely tried to press the clock but failed. Now, let's see. Do they give specific stuff? Because um, I, I have some insight into this, actually. Uh, Napoleon, she pointed out such things happened. The day of the Glorious Appeals Committee, it took them one hour to decide if they should continue the game when one of the players lost on time. I think it's a nice precedent, so someone appeals. Okay, I lost on time, but I don't accept it. I disagree. I think the game should be played on for a bit more, so give me back my time. The clock isn't working and so on, but this is part of the game everyone knows. Now, there is also a problem with this, which I don't think Nepo is going to mention about this. But one of the problems with this whole thing is those of you guys who might not be aware, but the way that appeals work for games is if you lose a game and you try to make an appeal, you have to give FIDE a certain amount of money. Now, I believe in this case it was 500 euros. I could be wrong on that, but I think it's 500 euros in order to make an appeal. Now, the great thing is due to anti-cheating measures and players not being allowed to have anything on them, I was told that basically Andrew Hong, one of the reasons that this also was prolonged so for, for a while, is that Andrew Hong basically had to go and get money because literally Fiji was not willing to deal with the appeal unless he came up with the money. Now, I can't be certain of this because I wasn't there, but I heard this from a couple of people that he basically had to go get the money. And um, like that to me is insane. The fact that you can't, you, you say someone has to show the money right there when they also can't bring money to the site is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons it went long, longer. Now, I could be wrong on this, obviously, but I did hear this. I think Sagar, Sagar, Sagar Shah also even mentioned this some, somewhere, or there was some video of him and Vita too. Uh, Vita and Prague and all of them talking, I think, about this exact thing um, at the event live. So that, to me, is a sign of Fide really not understanding things. So the fact is, you can charge someone money to file an appeal. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but at the end of the day, deal with the appeal and then... They can, they can come up with the money like five hours later or a day later, two hours later. They can wire money, whatever it is. But to actually say you have to show the money right then and there is just really, really poor on Fide's part. Really, really poor um, by Fide. And I, again, I could be wrong on this, but I did hear this from a few people. And I saw also a video of Sagar Shah, Vida, and others talking about this. So could be wrong, but that's, that's, that's what I heard. Anyway, let's keep going with the article. Napomna Shi explains something similar happened to Carlson in their game in the 2021 World Championship, but I can't recall him appealing the result. His real issue, though, was the delay to the tournament. 
a very unfortunate moment but obviously this is not something you should discuss for one hour and also it was quite amazing in a bad way the women's tournament which had no problem with appeals and had all the pairings ready they could play i think two rounds during this time and maybe they just had something like two rounds or three rounds left so our dear ladies were just waiting as well as all the other players which in my opinion is just ridiculous agreed once again um that obviously the women's event should have continued at the same time um, for the Dubov diplomacy game, nothing happened after it was played, and only a round later at the end of the day did Slovakian chief arbiter Ivan Sirovi publish a decision to punish the players with zero points, each because they had done something to bring the game of chess into disrepute. Okay. Nepomnesi had had few issues with the punishment. I think this is quite fair. I have no problem. Obviously, all the moves were played, and I understood there's a good chance of being fined in this or that way. The way he decided to act is one of the possible ways. He did object, however, to the decision not being taken immediately after the game, but instead leaving him and Dubov at the venue for another 90 minutes after the game ended at around 10 p.m. They appealed, though there was little reason for optimism, especially when it emerged our conversation before the game had been caught on Chessbase India's microphones. Okay. The Pomnishi also felt there was another fundamental issue with the appeals committee and one that had been brought up by Jim Jan Ludwig Hammer earlier in the day. And here's Jan Ludwig Hammer. Don't worry, Emil's on it. Seems like a decent moment to suggest the appeals committee should have a bit more independence from FIDE's administration and their political ally. So you can see Emil Satovsky is a reserve member of the appeals committee. But I'm also going to give you guys another take, which I think people might be aware of. People probably don't realize this, but for most FIDE events, there is an appeals committee. And for if you are on this appeals committee, it's actually a very cushy job. In many cases, you will get you will get paid money. You'll get great condition. You'll get hotel covered, airfare covered, and you get money to be on the appeals committee. This is one of the things that is very, very well known within FIDE. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a very good gig. So essentially, one of the things that happens if people support FIDE, they can actually end up being on these appeals committees and making money because of that. So... Um, when, when, when Jan Ludwig Hammer says this, he's absolutely correct. He says FIDE's administration and their political allies. I would definitely highlight political allies specifically as being the key, key, uh, key words here that Hammer mentions. And I, I agree with him. I, I agree with him. So let's go back to the article. All right. Um, Fortunately, FIDE CEO GM Emil Satovsky didn't need to be used as a reserve member since he'd already expressed his own highly critical view of the game on X slash Twitter. But that just emphasizes Nepomnesi's point in the podcast. The thing is, all these members, it doesn't matter if they're good players, bad players, active players, or inactive players, but all those guys in the lady are members of FIDE. Everyone is a FIDE official. And this is, I think, unacceptable because no matter if your appeal is good or bad, you're not going to face too much objectivity because I don't think a FIDE official will cancel a decision of another FIDE official or arbiter. Also very true. Very, very true. Um, and all these things, by the way, I'll be clear, are very, very well known within chess. These are not new things. These are things that, it, that have been going on for the last like 50 years. This is, this is not something new um, in regards to the pills committee being FIDE officials or political allies, people who support the administration. This is very, very well known. This is not some big shocking, shocking thing. Uh, it might not be publicly out there, but within the chess world, very, very well known. Um, the appeal was rejected unanimously, with Nepomnesi unhappy that some issues he'd raised were dismissed with the one word, irrelevant. This is a very dangerous practice just saying, don't bring into disrepute. Well, all right, but please specify. If it's a prearranged draw, then please don't use dual standards. There are numerous games which are prearranged in the same tournament, and you don't act. Or if you don't like the move orders, then all right. Or maybe you don't like the move quantity, but please specify. That would be, I guess, quite helpful to know to keep up some logic. Now, I agree with what Nepo says here, this is true because the problem with this is you end up on this dangerous slope or what's the issue? Is it the fact that they play these random night moves? Is it, is it the fact that they play 13 moves? Like, what do you do now when someone, when, when someone plays a draw in the Berlin, and it'll happen obviously in the future, there's this Ber a forced draw with 10 moves in the Berlin Berlin defense um, and the Rui Lopez, what do you do? You could very easily make an argument that, hey, they brought the game in disrespute, they made a draw. Like they could have prearranged it, maybe they didn't, you don't know. But there are possibilities now to sort of obscure obscure this and, and basically go down the slope because of the decision that has been made before. Um, so uh, I do think, I mean, what they should have said is basically the, the way they did it was not normal. It was, it was clearly like, it was, it was clearly basically that they had arranged it and they did not, they did not play like a, chess opening or something like that. I mean, I, I don't quite know what the wording or the verbiage should be, but it should be something along those lines. They should just say, you can't, you, you can't play things that are clearly not, not standard chess moves or something like that. I, I don't know, something like that, okay? Um, 
Napoleon, she felt the case could potentially be nice to shed some light onto this great part of professional chess, i.e. on how to handle draws in general. He doesn't think banning draw offers or limiting them to after a certain move of chess.com has done recently is the solution. So speaking of the quick draws, the draw offer itself is a part of the game. I don't think it should be encouraged to offer a draw before the round, before the game actually starts. So this is important. I agree. Restricting players from draws is slightly weird. It would end in a big explosion in popularity of the Berlin variation or the Catalan Bishop F4, Bishop C1 line, a well-known line as well. I think it recently happened in some of the top tournaments or some exchange slot with Bishop F4, Bishop F5, and so on, so on, so on. There are many, many draws. Some are very spectacular. Some are very boring. Some are Berlin draws, Queen E4, D4. So there's a wide, there's a very wide spectrum of all imaginable draws. And even now, the Dance of the Knights probably will take its shameful place among the others. So this is basically a very good question. What to do? He suggests trying to encourage players to encourage playing for a win, for instance, with a three points for a win scoring system or by making number of wins the first tiebreaker. In San Marcan, meanwhile, there is nothing to be done but continue the game. 0 0.5 points from Gryffindor. This wasn't the first drama that she was involved with at the tournament. Let's take a look at the other issues briefly. So generally, I mean, the thing that I would say about this is draws are going to be a part of the game, whether it's now, whether it's 10 years from now, 20 years from now, draws are part of the game. And pl chess players are very clever. They will always find their ways. They'll find the loopholes to make the draws no matter what. So I think this notion of banning draws or acting like something that doesn't happen is just very... It's very foolhardy, in my opinion, for, for people to try and pretend that it's not going to continue to exist because it is going to exist for as long as we play chess. Okay, moving on. All right. On Magnus Carlsen's private lounge, a two-time challenger comments in the podcast, I got perhaps unreasonably active on Twitter, but looking at some other guys' Twitter is pure enjoyment. I think even Wesley joined Twitter for quite some time. The first tweet that made an impact was about the privilege for the world champion. Uh, he tweeted this out. He says, I'm not going to read the tweet. It says the tweet clearly struck a chord as it was soon retweeted by James Fabiano Caruana and Vashi Lagrave. Napomaji noted that being able to rest and prepare between rounds may be worth one to one and a half points over 20 games. The issue wasn't so much that any players had privileges since he lists previous events in St. Petersburg, Moscow, Warsaw, and Almaty, where various top players either had personal lounges or were able to share a FIDE VIP lounge. He even notes that when GMP Karnakmar got COVID in Warsaw, it was a little bit of an awkward moment as they'd been sitting for a long time in adjacent chairs. Also true as well. That's right. That's right. I remember because Nepo and uh, I think it was Kai Rulin and, and myself and Chris Littlejohn, we were in the same room together and then I got COVID. Um, so he's, he's right about this. Okay. This year, however, was supposed to be different. Coming to this year's championship, I also asked Fide and Fide said, okay. Finally, there will be no... Oh, this is actually important. So Nepo saying he asked Fide before the event. He says, I also asked Fide, and Fide said, okay, finally, there will be no preference for any player. No one will get any private conditions. Everyone will be equal. All right, so they ensured me that the new state of things, actually playing the first day of the World Rapid, I got a little bit angry because I saw that, okay, no one has any access anywhere. No one but Magnus. The row was diffused by quietly inviting some players to the Fide lounge, as in previous years, while Carlson clarified that he didn't have access to a laptop. Okay. Uh, so on top of a private room, he also has a private lake as well. <laughs> nice tweet. Um, on the dress code, the one chess drama that was entirely predictable. Actually, by the way, I'll go back to this very briefly. This whole thing is complete nonsense, by the way. I would just say nobody should have special access. Either nobody has access. Everyone has to hang around having their tea in the, in, in the area where everybody is. Or, um, or everybody has access to a lounge. That's what I would say. I actually think that in the future, nobody should be. And if you try to give some silly excuse like Magnus gets mobbed, um, that's completely ridiculous because in the playing hall, and I can say from past events, like Mag Magnus, Magnus was not mobbed because only players can be in the area. So only players can be in the area. And, and when I look back to one that I played, I think in all Mahdi a year ago, um, like there, there were times I didn't use the lounge. And when I didn't use the lounge, it was basically this area where players were basically getting coffee or tea. They, they'd have water, some some little snacks, and everyone was there. So fans could not get in and um, and do stuff. And, and he couldn't be mobbed by players anyway because Magnus has this, has this few Norwegian friends who are always around him. And additionally, the chess players don't have access to their phones when you're when you're in the playing area. So none of that would have been ha would have happened. So the players just should not have it. Period. It should be everyone has the same standards. End of story. End of story. Um, so, okay. Um, 
Moving on, on the dress code. There, the one chess drama that was entirely predictable before the event began was over the dress code with the impeccably dressed Dutch WI and Anna Maya Kazarian falling victim to the ban or was there on sneakers? Okay. Update. I got fine. This is absolutely ridiculous. At Phoenix Chess, please revert this warning. My shoes are not sports sneakers. Um, one of the arbors stopped me and asked me if I could change my shoes because they were strange shoes and considered sports shoes. It hurts to even walk in those, and I definitely don't want to use my Burberry sneakers for sport. Okay. Um, all right, pretty insane, but let's keep going. Nepomushi comments, here I'll try to be candid. I think this is completely ridiculous. The dress code shouldn't be anything like that strict at any open tournament because basically during an open tournament, it's very hard to control a few hundred people following your dress code, whatever you call it. He took aim at FIDE's directing criticism of the guidelines towards the FIDE Athletes Commission made up of 14 players and chaired by Egyptian GM Ahmed Adli. I think this is quite weird by FIDE to readdress all the questions to their Athletes Commission, whatever it is. Maybe I'm not a frequent visitor of FIDE.com, but when I was told that, okay, it's not FIDE rules, it's the Athletes Commission who came up with this dress code for this year and bring all your questions to your fellow colleagues, this was a little bit shocking. So I asked some of my friends from the commission. They replied they had never heard a thing about this dress code, so they didn't take part in working on this paper. It's nice. This just gets better and better. FIDE basically said, here's the commission. Take it up with them. And this commission didn't even make the rules. Man, amazing. Amazing stuff. Wow. What would he suggest for a dress code? It should be quite reasonable. So let's say not going in shorts would probably boost interest in chess, but maybe you shouldn't play in a bikini and so on. But to be honest, I don't see any problem in jeans where some jeans, all sorts of sneakers, just look good, be stylish, and so on. And out of my experience, of course, it's much more comfy to play in a hoodie or a sweatshirt rather than in some official trousers, jacket, and a black tie. So I think this is quite unnecessary, and I hope this will be changed. Many pointed out that other players or FIDE officials seem to be able to flout the dress code. Well, of course, I agree with Nepo here too. I think I, I think my attitude towards the um, towards dress code is very simple. It should be this: wear basically wear pants. I think jeans are fine as long as they're not ripped. I think jeans should be fine. Um, I think sneakers should be fine. I mean, probably you should not wear like a t-shirt. I think maybe wearing like a dress shirt or something that's like collared is completely reasonable. Um, so maybe no t-shirt, no ripped jeans. And I'd say that's about it, in my opinion. I, I, I really think that's about it. And again, the other notion of the dress code, like it it's really feels very silly to me because at the end of the day, chess is not going to be, like p sponsors are not going to care what the players are wearing as long as it doesn't look ridiculous. Um, probably no flip-flops, I agree. No shorts, no no like sandals, uh, no t-shirt, no ripped jeans. Those are probably the big four. And everything else should be completely reasonable. Um, so... Let's 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 go on. And it wasn't only Samarkand that Nepomneshi touched on, however, since he had turned to the subject of qualifying for the Candace turn, the event that decides who faces the world champion in a match on how Faruja, Gukesh, and Ding and Ding qualified for the candidates. Faruja's extraordinary path to qualifying for the 2024 Candace tournament in Toronto in place of GM Wesley so almost rivaled the world rapid and blitz for the excitement over the holiday period. He qualified based on the January FIDE rating list, with Nepomneshi taking aim at the system. First of all, I'd like to criticize the idea of qualifying by rating in terms of only one rating list, which matters. January 1st, 2024. It turns out that the system um, is quite easy not to hack, but to in some way overrun the current standings. I completely agree with this. Completely agree. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so actually, chat might be delayed. Let me see. Maybe it is. But anyway, let's keep going. He summed up the matches Faruja played against the veteran opponents in Chartres with, I don't think it was anything pre-arranged if you ask me, but in general, those players are, are not really capable of fighting with such a top-tier player on equal terms. Nepomneshi here felt that FIDE should take action, as in the end they did by not rating the event, but notes that nothing was done when Ding met the requirements for the 2022 Madrid candidates with some very curious events in China. Those qualification terms for Ding looked pretty bad. It was screamingly suspicious, but FIDE never interfered, and we all know where it led. In a way, I paid my price for also being silent. I thought maybe the only good moment to speak about this would be winning the World Championship match and then speak my mind openly. But yeah, I came close, but not close enough to that point. So anyway, it's better late than never. I don't think using such loopholes in the rules should be encouraged. Of course, um, I, agree with, um, I, I agree with what he's saying here that, I mean, it should not be encouraged, but 
you know, it, it is what it is. And also to be clear, I, I do want to make one point. Like there was a player who did try to make an issue about this. And that player was Levon Aronian. Um, and he did actually, he did send a letter to, I think it was USCF basically wanting to complain about what Ding had done with playing all those games in China. But the U.S. Chess Federation basically told him that it was silly and nothing could be done about it. So just to be clear, it's not as though nobody did try to say something, but but um, nothing happened. All right. Ding defended that event in an interview with Peter Doggers in the run-up to Vicon Zay. There is video recorded of it, so I can prove that there was nothing wrong with it. Also, I am very proud about my performance since... Since they are not nobodies, they are quite talented players. They also won the World Team Championship later this year. Puzzle puzzle Rush will be a little bit later, in about 25-30 minutes. Nepomushi had fewer complaints about Faruja's 7 out of 7 to get himself over the line and ruin open, though his congratulations were grudging at best. This is an example of some farming of the rating. But once again, as bad as it looks, technically he didn't violate any rules, at least in the Christmas term. So what can we do? Probably we can only congratulate him with qualifying to the candidates. All right. Nepomnishi also suggests that, that a late event on the FIDE circuit, the Chennai Masters, gave an unfair advantage to the Indian players it was designed to help Gukesh and Arjun, who he notes by fun coincidence tied for first place with Gukesh snatching the spot that had previously been GM Anish Giri's. Other players who could compete for the FIDE circuit, I think it was Wesley as well as Anish, they basically had no such opportunity. So there were no normal tournaments and not so many places in the world you can organize a strong round-robin tournament in a week or two weeks or something. Okay. Uh, what's this? Geary may have Geary may have missed the candidates, but he at least at least he escaped the sneaker tax. <laughs> oh my God! This picture. Look at this picture. Oh man, he escaped the sneaker tax. Yep, he, he was wearing sneakers, but hey, no fine, no 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 sneaker tax. Nepomnishi also questioned the number of points on offer compared to a grueling event like the Tata Steel Masters. And overall, as you can see, the two-time challenger isn't thrilled with FIDE's efforts. He pointed out the late announcement of the event in Samarkand was another reason for a memorable New Year's tweet. Okay, let 2024 bring FIDE everything that it lacks. Transparency, integrity, clear rules, unified standards, wide judges, attentive organized, recognizable sponsors, happy New Year FIDE chess. Now, I actually feel like a lot of what Nepo says here is very reasonable, but I'll be, I'll be completely blunt about this. The problem with all of this is that none of this stuff will ever be possible unless the top grandmasters together as a group stand up and try to fight for some of these things. If it's individually, one person complaining about this, one person complaining about that, everyone complaining separately, nothing will ever change. The only way that there will be changes is if the top grandmasters get together and do this together as a group. If they don't do that, nothing will change ever. Um, epilogue, night dance again entitled Tuesday. Just when, just when the drama, just when the dance of the night drama died down, it flared up again with yesterday's late title Tuesday, which Dubov won after revisiting that earlier game in his round eight clash with Nipomo Iyashi. Two rounds later, Nipomo Iyashi would do, did the same thing as Nakamura, once again illustrating just how polarizing the issue is. Reactions vary wildly. Levy says hilarious. Just 10 days after their double forfeit at the World Chess Championship, Nepomnishi and Dubov just made another draw by doing the horsey dance, this time entitled Tuesday. And then we see Levon jump into the fray here, which says, I don't understand the motivation of having fixed draws and playing some ridiculous moves. What message are we relaying to the fans and newcomers of chess? Very similar to some form of modern art performance where the artist takes a dump on the scene. Bravo. Now, I'm going to be very clear on this, a couple of things. First of all, um, as far as the draws goes, this is online chess. This is titled Tuesday. And this is, I'm going to be frank, for top players, not exactly for a lot of money. $1,000, so a player like Mpomashi, Dubov, or myself is not that big of a deal. So if you want to try and have some fun and make a draw, that's fine. Obviously, as far as my game goes, it was not prearranged because I didn't even know I was going to be playing against Nepo in that game. Um, but I want to stress, there's a very, very big difference here. When you look at the game that was played in the FIDE World Rap and Blitz Championship, there's a lot of money on the line. There's a title on the line. The games are ranked. That is different than online games, for example, where there's very little on the line. And frankly, content does matter. Trying to, trying to make chess accessible and exciting is something that does matter. And so for Lev to, to say this thing about fans and newcomers of chess, I feel like it's very, very strange to see Lev jumping into this, considering that Lev has basically done nothing for chess during the pandemic and the entire boom that has happened. So for him to come out here and try to act like, you know, fans and newcomers, like he knows what they want or what they're thinking, I think it's just, it, it's really wrong of Levon to say this. I'm just going to be honest here. I think it's wrong of Lev to say this. Um, and I would also say that when you look at the pandemic and the entire chess boom that occurred, 
from 2020 to about 2022 one of the single biggest factors of the boom especially when it relates to top level chess is players having fun the game seeming excited the players seemingly not taking themselves too seriously uh played a huge role it seemed very accessible and all these things contributed greatly and when players start taking chess too seriously start acting like you can't do this you can't do that that is something that i think in the long term is going to actually affect chess very adversely so uh, I think I think what, what Lev is saying here. I mean, he, he can he can say this, but I think he's just wrong. I think he's just wrong. Um, and saying fixed draws, I would also add. I, let me let me say this to use like not to be biblical or anything, but as, as the saying goes, let he who let he who has never made a quick draw be the first to to um, to to uh, to comment about draws and act as though they're you're outraged by them because every top player has made quick draws Lev's made quick draws I have Fabiano has every top player has made quick draws so I I, met, I messed up the quote but I think you get guys get the gist of what I'm saying here which is let he who has never made a quick draw be the first to cast stones that's that's where I'll end it with um and it says will this be the last dance so yeah that's 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 the bottom line I mean, this is a very very long article a lot of stuff is important in here um but yeah it is what it is